Great. So um, welcome, everybody. Um, so welcome to the Skywork Weekly Conversation. Um, my name is Abdallah, or Abdu, as many people call me, and I'm going to be your host for today. This is my first time hosting, so thanks to Andrew uh, and Alberta for making this happen. So very briefly, I'm a research scientist at CWI in Amsterdam, and I'm also on the executive board for Kai Netherlands, which is an ACM local chapter. And again, thanks to Andrew for making this possible, and I'm happy to support this wonderful series. Um, so first, I just uh, would like to thank the technical program uh, chairs for, uh, for all this. So Navina Karusala, Toby Lee, Aaron Solovey, Shadan Sadarian, Max Wilson, and Andrew Kuhn, as well as the student volunteers, um, Alberta Ansa, uh, who's the assistant to the technical program chairs and is helping so much behind the scenes. Isabel Munoz is our web chair, and Naveel Alnahin CH is our video chair and accessibility co-chair along with Alberta. And we'd like to thank the National Science Foundation for partially funding this event. And so let me start with a few basic logistics. Uh, so the first part of this event, as you may have noticed, is recorded. And we very much look forward to questions from the audience. So please throughout, uh, feel free to just type in your questions in the chat, um, and then we, we can get to the Q&A afterward. And after half an hour, roughly, uh, please stick around for the rest of the conversation. It won't be recorded, and it'll have a bit of more of an informal flavor. Um, so right now, I'm very happy to welcome uh, Dr. Jay Lee, and uh, I'll start with a brief bio. So, um, so Dr. Jay Lee is an HCI researcher with a background in industrial design engineering. Her research focuses on developing user experience evaluation methods for immersive experiences, and she's now the head of research and insights at EPAM, and also a creative cake designer owning a boutique cafe called Cake Researcher. Okay, so welcome, Jay. Um, and maybe let's kick this off by starting with uh, a question uh, regarding your Kai 2019 work on measuring and understanding photo sharing experiences in social virtual reality. So here you compared photo sharing either in face-to-face -face interactions uh, uh, using Skype or you know Zoom perhaps, um, or using Facebook Spaces, and you found that social VR can approximate face-to-face -face sharing. Mm -hmm. So I want to first ask you about the motivation behind this work, and if you could summarize it for us and tell us a little bit about what led you to do this type of research. Yeah, okay, hello everyone. Thank you for inviting me to be here. Thank you, Abdul, for hosting the session. Uh, so uh, you're yeah, talking about the work actually, which I have, been, I have done before COVID. So this work, the motivation is not, it's part of the EU project called VR Together. So just by this name, you know, we want to actually, actually developing not isolated VR experiences, but more social experience in VR. So my part of work as a researcher in this EU project is to develop this kind of new social experiences and also come up with methods or even questionnaires, you know, qualitative methods to measure and understand users' experience in those uh, shared uh, virtual environments. That's what, that was the motivation behind. Um, and I think for this work, uh, I remember we started by collected uh, a lot of publish, uh, published standard questionnaires wide range effects of communication, interaction. Uh, for instance, the famous uh, presence questionnaires by Vitmi and Singer. And we also used uh, uh, Janet, this gamers immersion questionnaire. We also have uh, uh, like some questionnaire about uh, quality of communication, uh, for instance, by Garo, uh, uh, who proposed in 2023. We also have a social connectedness questionnaire proposed by Fan Bell in 2009. So all those questions, you can imagine if we pile them together and we ask the participants, please fill in all those questionnaires because we need to understand your experience. It, take, it will take them an hour to do so. And still there's a lot of redundancy, like you can see many overlaps in those questionnaires. Um, so that's why I would say, okay, we actually need a, a, a dedicated or specific questionnaire just dedicated to our project. So this we are together social experience, right? Uh, then how do how we are going to do that? So we 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 just have this idea. Okay, we need to have a standard questionnaires developed by us, 
and just to be used uh, in this project to measure uh, social experiences uh, across uh, the three-year project. Uh, so that's the whole motivation behind. And in the end, um, we, we applied a user-centered way just to come up what kind of items we need to include in this questionnaire. Um, of course, we, we, we bring users to discuss about what experience you, you can have in social virtual reality, and but but getting those insights, we need to give them some activity. So photo sharing is an activity we select in this case because it can trigger really rich dynamic improvisational conversations uh, in in social environment. Uh, so that's that's only a use, but that use case is prepared all the invited users or participants in the uh, explorative stage of the study come up with experiences or interactions that can happen in shared virtual environments. And that's uh, become the, the, the background or the, the base of our questionnaire items. Of course, we still consider all the standard questionnaires, which we borrow, borrow items from uh, presence questionnaire if we want to measure presence still. Um, so that's, uh, I think, in the end, uh, in order to um, uh, validate this question as well, because we, we cannot just uh, construct 30 items question and just say, okay, we are going to measure quality of interaction and social meaning using that, because we also need to prove those items we, we took in this act measured the thing we intended to do. Uh, so then, then to, to validate this, we run an experiment. So that's a within subjects design just to compare people's social experience in social VR. And we used the Facebook spaces in 2018, that was okay. Um, and we also used the video conferencing too. Uh, at that time, was, uh, Skype was popular. Um, and then we also used uh, like a real life photo sharing. So then we compare people's sharing experiences in these three conditions. And after each condition, they fill in our social VR questionnaire. And the collected data help us to validate uh, the items. Actually, it's the internal uh, uh, validity of the question is really high. Like uh, the, the the validity coefficient is really high. So um, that's um, now we kind of prove that with this set of data, this question there is valid. But also later on throughout the project, we are continuously using the same questionnaire. We collect the data, validate validate it. Uh, yeah, the re results is not always the same. Uh, sometimes we also get opposite results, especially today. Um, people actually prefer video calls more than social VR. And that's some recent uh, surprise we, I heard from uh, my friend, colleague, who is using this social VR questionnaire. So, yeah. well, so, actually, so that was my follow-up question. So, in, uh, you know, you ran the study in 2018, 2019, mm -hmm. now in 2023. And as I'm sure we all know that the, the pace of technology development, especially with respect to AR, VR, it's, it's rapidly changing. We have new devices, new ways of interacting. So in, in what way would you think that, you know, the, your findings from that study where you compared Facebook spaces, would that still hold today? Or would you expect things to be different now that we have more immersive, more engaging, you know, technologies that give higher sense of presence, let's say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I want to mention this opposite findings. I was talking to Sylvia Penn. So she's also an um, uh, XR researcher, uh, a professor at the Goldsmith University. We met in person last week. So actually, we were discussing. Uh, she was teaching uh, uh, this social VR questionnaire in one of her classes, and she asked the students to try out of space VR and then fill in the questionnaire. And then she did twice. So one time, I, once is before, like at the beginning of COVID and uh, uh, later, uh, now it's uh, already after COVID. Um, so uh, then she just tell me at the beginning, she kind of replicate our readouts. So we see uh, like people feel more immersed and people prefer social VR than video calls. That's our readouts. So she replicated. Um, but recently the, the class uh, produced so students to rate um, the quality of interaction of video calls and then uh, social VR. So we were discussing why this can happen, like uh, why it's the, the results completely changed. So we're, we're thinking maybe that's, um, that's something we, we do uh, with, um, sorry, I have an interruption. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's something like uh, maybe 
after COVID, because people are so used to video calls and the quality of a video calls nowadays, if you see Zoom or so see Teams, the, they are much more feature, much uh, many more features than before than we use Skype. Uh, so that can also change because people are used to the technology uh, and they are using it on daily and the, the technology is also evolving. Uh, so we're guessing. So that can be the, the results why uh, there is opposite uh, results. Um, and I think another thing I noticed is also people asking me uh, through emails because they said, oh, okay, we, we are running experiments and we want to use your social VR questionnaire, but we noticed some items your questionnaire cannot be applied in our experiments because we are doing XR. So we are doing mixed reality. So then people, uh, because some items in our questionnaire, we're asking, do you feel the virtual world is actually surrounding you? But in a, augmented or mixed reality scenario, you see the, the like, like the, the virtual world is on top of your physical world. So you see kind of both worlds around you. So in this kind of situation, so our social VR is limited. We cannot actually apply uh, um, that just if they want to run mixed reality studies. So that's if we, uh, if they want to use it, they have to adapt it. Uh, and another thing I'm constantly, think, constantly thinking is um, if I'm going to do it again, I, I'm quite interested in measuring the photoreals, photorealistic representations as compared to cartoon avatars in terms of photo. Capturing. So now we have IC Labs capturing people's 3D videos in real time and uh, construct, reconstruct them and deliver them to virtual reality. Um, that can, can create quite different experience than the, those Facebook avatars where you, you, you see just a cartoon representation of yourself. You have very limited facial expression and, uh, and the uh, body language. But with photorealistic, those, those volumetric videos, actually you see way more uh, clues, like uh, nonverbal clues when you are communicating with people. So I'm personally still very interested in compare uh, 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 those two different kinds of representations. Yeah, I think that's something I, if I can imagine redo it, uh, that will, will be something I'm interested to try um, and figure out why people prefer video calls more than social VR nowadays. Great, so thanks Jay. So on that note, I would also regarding nonverbal cues, I would very much encourage everybody, if you have the capacity or capability or would like to, to also turn on your camera so we can also see some nonverbal behavior. Um, <laughs> Jay, I would like to follow up on this, on mm -hmm. uh, work that I find very interesting. Uh, it's on Cake VR, so Cake Virtual yeah. Reality. And it seems to be a very nice example of the future of work. So mm -hmm. I would like you to tell us about this and describe a little bit about the motivation of this work, what were the key findings, and also, to what extent would pastry chefs are willing to adopt the system? And what obstacles remain, in your opinion, regarding such uh, an interaction between a client and, um, and a pastry chef, let's say? Okay, that's really, I, I also personally like this work a lot. I'm so proud to get it published at Kai. Uh, so uh, actually, I was at a, a cake a course with a, a group of pastry chefs just uh, uh, 15 minutes ago. So and the motivation behind this work is also part of this We Are Together project. You know, this whole project is about developing social experience uh, in virtual reality. So that's part of the VR project, but it's also out of my personal interest. And so um, so I'm, I'm a researcher, and so that's my, my daily 40-hour uh, job. But uh, uh, along, uh, besides, I'm also like a pastry chef uh, myself. So I... I I have I own the boutique cafe and uh, I'm making like I don't know ten thousand of cakes or it is something like that. Uh, so I actually experienced a lot of frustrations while I communicate the design of customized cake with my clients. So imagine they are ordering a big wedding cake from me, and it's their big day. The the, the tolerance for mistake is really low, and but the communication cost is so high. Like. Uh, it's making a cake is really like, uh, sometimes I feel they are buying a house from me, not a cake, you know, <laughs> that's my feeling. That's uh, so in order to, for instance, in order to show them the cake size, I usually use a lot of cake dummies. We, it's kind of the foamed uh, cake uh, into different sizes. 
and they're made of foam. Uh, and I need to store a lot of those kick dummies in different shapes, different size, you know, in, your, in my storage room and it's just take a lot of space, but I need to keep them because that's a way they can kind of see how big their wedding cake can be. Um, and also, uh, I also need to find a lot of reference pictures to show them the details of the design and even do sketching myself. It's all time consuming. And sometimes I even need to make decoration sam samples. Like I need to actually make the sugar flowers and to tell them the color, the shape, and the, the approximate uh, look and feel of the cake. Yeah. So overall, it's like a, before I start making the cake, I already spend weeks just, just communicating with them. It's really painful. And this uh, this like COVID time increases this difficulty dramatically because I many of the time I just can't, even cannot see the couple there was one wedding cake during COVID time the whole period we didn't see each other I, I never see the couple um, and I still need to to kind of tell them how big the cake is because this couple really cares about the cake the size of the cake they are really tall so the husband was like two meters so he doesn't want the cake look like a miniature in front of him so then how I'm going to communicate okay then we have, we have to use virtual reality right so if they can join me into a virtual reality remote because we cannot meet in, in person and in virtual reality, I can show them, okay, that's the size of the, your wedding cake. And it's going to be this tall, this wide, it won't look too small in front of two meters you. Yeah, so that's, I think uh, the, that's out of my personal interest. Then it's also a nice use case for this EU project. That's brought me to do this cake VR, cake VR work. Thanks, Jay. Just a quick follow up on this. So when you were interviewing mm -hmm. those pastry chefs during your work, um, or and maybe when you let them try the prototype, mm -hmm. what obstacles do you think uh, remain in, in getting this technology to, to these people and how they would use it? Yeah, I think while I was interviewing them, that was at, before I developed in the system. Uh, so they actually have the exact the same pain points as what I have now. So it's uh, so the, it's really just tedious process and uh, taking so many hours, non-paid almost, right? Um, and, but after um, we developed this uh, uh, system, Cake VR, we invite, uh, I, th I think 10 pastry chefs back just to, to evaluate the system. Um, they are quite willing to, to use it. So uh, it's, it's quite an interesting finding because Pastry chef, even that's your first time using virtual reality system, we train them uh, uh, like briefly, then they can they can already quickly use it, and they, they often spend a few minutes to to uh, like a finish your cake design. Because we also did this uh, prototype testing with clients, so people who don't make cakes, it takes them much more time actually uh, than a pastry chef to finish a, a virtual cake. So that's a finding I I got. So they are willing to use it. Uh, I think the most of the just the obstacle now is still the hardware. What I can uh, imagine is like a, if you want this communication platform to work, people have to have the device. So if the, the hardware cannot reach the, the popularity of smartphone, like everyone has one at home, then this kind of platform is still difficult to, to be put into practice. Because that's, I think that's uh, the main obstacle. But in terms of uh, usability, I think uh, still that's a prototype. It has needs to be improved a lot. But as a prototype itself, it can already support them to to build quickly build a cake and visualize a cake in front of the clients. And they can co-design the details of the cake. And also with uh, uh, like a. 3D modeling tools or even generative AI tools, I don't see the design aspects is an obstacle anymore because we can pre-made all those small items like the macarons, the virtual macarons, flowers in VR easily. Um, but uh, this obstacle is still the, the hardware. Great, thank you. So I, I'd like to expand the discussion a little bit um, on HCI and the future of work. You know very relevant to the topic here, and on collaborative experiences in general. So you, mm -hmm. you've given us an example of, you know, sharing, you know, photos with one another in social virtual reality, or even co-designing cakes. Mm -hmm. um, and I would, I'd like you to maybe just tell us a little bit about what you believe the future of, you know, um, of future of work and collaboration 
do you think we're going to enter into relying a lot on social virtual reality or are there other means? Um... Yeah, uh, I said like the hardware uh, issue, right? If this is not going to be solved and I don't think it will, it's going to be into the mainstream, even for those uh, 3D volumetric video capturing, if I, I cannot imagine install three depth cameras at my home to capture myself and then deliver my my hologram to my mother. <laughs> it's, uh, I cannot imagine doing this at home still, even the, the depth camera is still quite, is already quite small. So I, I will approach this question from the perspective of a creative worker. So I see myself as a designer, as a pastry chef. So I, in summary, I'm a creative worker. So in the future, I think the ideal creative collaboration uh, should not be limited by geographic distances, of course, and all nor skills such as drawing or 3D modeling. So because now there is a, a big barrier before between. I always consider myself I'm a designer, but, but there is like a, to become HCI researcher, like there is always a gap between designers and computer scientists because we have different skill sets. But yet we still have to work together to make this HCI uh, work happen. But uh, like a, uh, computer scientists don't have our uh, uh, our technical skills, like uh, drawing, 3D modeling, you know, this kind of skill. And we don't have uh, skills in, in coding or uh, statistics. So I think in the future with all those tools, you know, AI tools um, or all the automating uh, tools can, can facilitate this uh, collaboration between people from different disciplines much easier. So I can imagine uh, if we can automate in the routine design tasks, uh, such as wireframing, sketching, and the color selection, which can already be done by AI nowadays. And uh, we creative workers can maximize our creativity uh, and uh, sense of aesthetics or empathy towards our users. So that's the part we need to focus and train us, not those basic design skills anymore. And also people from non-design profession, they can also do the same because they, they don't need to to uh, obtain uh, like basic design skills in order to design. Um, I think I think field collaboration will be really inter truly interdisciplinary, um, and the skill sets are not divided by professions anymore. So I can imagine as a designer, uh, I can easily work with programming using maybe visual coding tools or perform statistical analysis with a more accessible interface. So that's, that's a future I can imagine. So everybody can can do, can understand other, other people's work and the other domain, even if it's not expert, but we, we share knowledge so we, and we work together. Thanks for this. I, I, I would love to come back to this point later because I think it's of course very relevant today with, you know, an mm -hmm. insane advancement of AI technologies that are enabling many people to, to do things they couldn't do previously. Um, but, you know, just to scope this, at least the recorded part of the session, um, mm -hmm. I'd like to come into maybe a bit of a personal kind of uh, thing. So, so seeing that you not only have a leg in academia, but another leg like in industry as well, and you also run a cake shop. So I'd yeah. like to invite you to share with us just a few reflections on, you know, what it's called a slash career and this inspiration of running a cake shop and also doing research on cakes on the side. So could you tell us a little bit how you manage all this? Um, also, you know, in the context of work, the future of work, and what you could tell, of course, people who aspire to also have multiple things happening concurrently. Okay, I can, I, I, people always ask me, how you manage your time? I said, no, I'm not managing your time. I'm trained to manage a crisis like today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I say, oh, I cannot drive back. I don't have place. I was checking the storage room where I can, if I can take the meeting at the storage room, no, it's all about the crisis. But yeah, in sometimes as a slasher, I call myself. So I have multiple careers at the same time. Um, it's, it's more about managing your time and uh, manage the, the situation where you don't have a plan B. And uh, I think most important is managing my passion. So when I do things uh, I really I like, um, I don't feel I, I'm, I'm tired. I, I am wasting time, you know, I don't do work because that's, that's my passion. I, I spend time like, like I take a half a day off today on my, in my working week just to attend a, a sugar flower workshop. 
that's that's what I need. I need to balance. Uh, so for me, like making cakes, I like th think many other people who have a, a hobby. So just doing the things you like, like doing your hobby, it's like a meditation. As so we are all computer workers. So for uh, it keeps me away from my computer for half an hour in the afternoon. It often happens like in my working days. I often just uh, leave my desk and uh, jump. Uh, I always work in my cafe, you know, my kitchen is behind me. I leave my desk and I, will, I go straight to, to, into my kitchen. I spend half an hour just doing cake. It's a light physical activity. Um, I never feel like I'm wasting time because it brings me into a state of flow. Even it's short, it's light, and you're, it also helps me. Like I just have the habit to go deep into deep concentration um, while making cake, and this somehow trained my con concentration skills, and which I can perform better uh, and be more concentrated on my research work. So that's what what I noticed. Um, and also find out like a Having multiple roles, uh, will of course, create a lot of stress. Um, but uh, I always try to just maintain uh, what I call its optimal stress level. So it won't make me sick, you know, if I'm too stressful, I burn out. But I need some stress to push myself just to not really be, um, be, just be creative and efficient. So if you have a little bit of stress, you, usually your creativity comes out. That's what I also, also sense, but I always learn to say no to excessive work because I said uh, some date uh, like in my week, I only make cakes on Monday night and Saturday afternoon. If your order is coming out of those time, I, sorry, I cannot take it. So that's uh, how I, I always try to say no and keep my personal time, my space and say no to excessive work. Yeah. Great, and, thank you so much. <laughs> um, I, maybe a quick follow-up on this. So if you would, if you would want to give advice to say to the younger generation, many of which find your cake work, you know, and research also very inspiring. So how would you, what would you advise uh, the younger generation? I would give the advice actually my professors give to me. Um, and actually I, that was last year of my PhD when I was really uh, a bit fed up. <laughs> I was thinking of, I'm not going to leave academia. I'm going to start my cake business and I quit completely academia. Um, then that's uh, that's what my professor told me. He said, okay, you spent so many years doing research and um, it's it's a pity. Like you just throw away uh, completely the, the things you have spent years, your effort and your passion on, right? It's also unfair. Uh, so then I also have a doubt, like, uh, do I really want to just become a, a, a cake, the cafe owner? Because after I, I'm being running my cafe before COVID for one and a half year on Saturdays, I also start to realize, no, I don't want that. It's, that's not the life I want. I don't want repetitive work, but I want creative work. Um, so then my advice is, would be, um, you, don't, you don't have to give up one career in order to pursue another one. So if you find yourself struggling to decide which path to take, uh, you can always consider like uh, both. Because for, for me, I now I'm joining the industry already, but I, I still try to connect with academic uh, researchers. Like I, I'm still co-authoring papers, supervising a PhD students. So I see when you cannot decide, you, you can just try to, to take both. And later you can always find a balance and, um, and you decide later. Great. Um, on this wonderful note, I would also invite everybody to check out Jay's Instagram page to see her cakes uh, and see how wonderful they are. So what I will do now is I will conclude the first part of this session, uh, the recorded session. So thank you again, Jay. And next week, please join us for a conversation with Urvashi and Ejo. Uh, the host is uh, to be announced. So indeed, we will stop recording now, but Please continue to join us for an informal conversation. We will also take questions from the audience. So again, thanks, Jay. Uh, 